Praise God. But if you have your Bibles today, we'll go ahead and start looking in Proverbs chapter number 3. I got a message to preach on this these two verses, but it's just like we can't get off the two verses to get to the message. But in Proverbs chapter number 3, verses 5 and 6, Proverbs chapter number 3, verses 5 and 6, I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and pray first. Father, we thank You for this day. We thank You for everyone that's here. Lord, we just ask You right now to touch hearts and lives and draw them closer to You. Lord, we love You and we thank You and we praise You for Your Word today that gives us inspiration. And it is Your Word that is forever settled in heaven, the Lord Jesus, that we can stand upon. We give You praise for it right now and we ask You right now to touch everybody in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The Scripture reads this in verse number 5. Trust in the Lord with... What's that next word? All your heart. Amen. That's a big difference if you're trusting God with half of your heart and trusting God with all your heart. Amen. There's a big difference even, and listen to me, if the Lord can't have us all, He don't want a piece of us today. Amen. And so if we're not willing to give us give Him 100% of our life, then, then we'll always be lacking because as long as we keep back a part of that heart, we'll always keep back some type of control or some type of surrender that should be going to the Lord. Amen? So trust in the Lord with all your heart. That means you stand there in faith even when it don't look like it, it's going to happen because God's Word declares that it will. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That Scripture right there will serve you well when the storms come. Yes. That Scripture right there will serve you well when somebody passes away. When you're going through the hardest situations that we could in life, trusting in the Lord with all of our heart will make a difference today because He has the key. He has the, the driveway that we're trying to find or the walkway or the pathway that we're trying to walk down today. He has that pathway. Amen. And all He's asking, listen, what we're seeing in these last days, if we listen to God's Word and lean upon the Lord and trust in Him with all of our heart and lean not upon our own understanding is the second part of verse number 5. And lean not on your own understanding. Here's how my mind works. If i got a problem, I try to fix it. Amen? Everybody most everybody like, is like that. We try to fix it. But you know what? The Bible tells us to not lean on our own understanding because that's whenever we try to do it our way. We try to fix it. We try to do something to try to curve it into our corner or curve it the way we want it to go. But can I tell you this? Sometimes you can't lean on what your, what your own understanding is telling you because your mind is so boggled and your mind is so filled with the, with the cares of this life that we can sit there and we can begin to lean on our own understanding. Well, this isn't working out so good right here. We need to put some more resources over there. Well, you know what the resources we ought to put is not what we can make it happen with our own self. It's whenever we take it to the Lord and cast it upon Him. Can I tell you why most Christians are, are tired and wore out today? Because they're carrying their burdens around instead of cast them on, casting them on the Lord. Amen. We're carrying our burdens around. But the Bible said, cast your cares on the Lord because He cares for you. Whatever thing that's on your mind today, whenever we say, we had a situation in our family and I just brought it up Wednesday night and I said, you know, this is the situation and this is what we're going to pray. And I told my, my family and whenever we were coming in, we have prayer requests every day. We've got things in our life that we need to be changed. We've got children today that's struggling in school 
And and I be, I'm a firm believer if they're struggling in school, now you 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 help them to learn more, but you also pray and ask God, Lord, whatever whatever's happening when they're trying to learn, whatever's whatever's causing them not to pay attention. <coughs> Amen. Yeah. I'm not losing anybody this morning, am I? <laughs> Amen. Because we want our children to grow up and we want them to know how to how to how to do things that we don't even know how to do. Amen. That's what our desire is. We want to see our children do greater than what we, we do. But sometimes we can't lean on our own understanding. We have to trust in the Lord and lean upon what He says. Look at the next verse. The next verse down. Verse number, praise God, 6. And in all your ways. Did it say some? No, that is that word all again. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. How many's ever done something in life they wish they could go back and get a mulligan? Yeah. Yeah. Woo Come on now. I'll be the first one to say that. Amen? You know why? Because God's got a pathway for us. And if we don't walk with Him, we won't be able to find it. We won't be able to find it easy. You know what we can compare it to today? You can compare life to a maze that has one way to get to heaven. That one way is Jesus Christ. But if we don't follow what the Lord is guiding us down, you know what you run into? A dead end. A dead end. And do you know what? Anybody, anybody in here ever... Ever run into a dead end? I have. You know what you want to do? You want to sit down and quit. Man, I've, I've, spent, I've, I've spent all my energy to go down that pathway. And I get to the end of it. And it was the wrong way. You know what? Then if God has a Scripture that tells us that the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord, that means that God has a step for me to make and a place for me to go and a pathway for me to walk down. And I want everybody to hear this clearly. When you follow God's pathway, you will not find your way at a dead end. You will not find your way backtracking, trying to figure out how to get back to go, but you will find out that there's even times that He says, Stop. Stay right there. Wait. Then He says, Move. Because see, not only do we have a pathway, and listen, as much as there is a God that is trying to help us to get to heaven, there is an enemy that is trying to stop us to get down to this pathway. He's trying to stop us from getting to where God desires us to be today. And that's with Him. Amen. In His presence. So we find ourselves through this life and we're having to make decisions. But here's what I want you to get out of this message. I want you to learn how to make godly choices. I want us to learn how to follow God's voice. And if He says for me to go away, even though that way don't look the best way, it's the way God chooses for me. And when we do it, He will bring about a, uh, a He will bring about a revival, and He will bring about a restitution within our life. Listen, there was a, and I won't spend much time on this. I tell you what, I'm just going to go on down. Let me let me move down just a little bit further in this message. All right, Christians, as we as Christians, we must navigate living in an interconnected world of constant texting, internet browsing, international news, one's constantly being bombarded with so many voices that knowing with certainty which are the right paths to take seems to be an extra exercise in futility. And while the world would have us to chase after money and fame and power, this makes little sense considering such endeavors are temporary and of little value considering the eternity God has placed within our hearts. Scripture states that the overall goal of life is to please God. Amen? Did you hear me? The overall goal of life is to please God. And can I tell you this? If we please God, we, our life will be a pleased life. Did you hear what I said? 
If we please God, our life will be a pleased life. If we go on down, it's, we read in 2 Corinthians 5 and 9, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him by striving towards becoming spiritually mature and attaining the full measure of Christ. Amen? In Ephesians 4.13, while knowing this overarching goal is of enormous value to us, this still begs the question, what does God-approved decision-making look like? What does God-approved decision-making look like? When each of us are each of His own, are given spiritual giftings and assigned unique divine uh, tasks to accomplish, we see in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 12, the church is called into a place of love and after that place of love, they show the spiritual giftings begin to happen. Amen? But first, we've got to have first to resonate inside of this house the love of the Gospel. While we know finding the right path to take in a maze of life could be difficult, but through prayer and fasting and reading God's Word, God can gently whisper into our ear, the decisions that we need to make and the places we need to go. Still, people wander aimlessly in the maze of life simply because they're too enamored with their own path. Sometimes even I think that we believe we're smarter than God. Let me just say this. If we look at the walls of Joshua, if you want to turn over, you can turn there, but it's in the book of Numbers. We're going to look at a lot of different uh, verses here. But we're going to look at the walls coming down. We want to look at three different things that happens and how God began to move His people into doing something extraordinary out of something ordinary. Amen? So as we see the walls of Jericho, Joshua was called by God to lead the children of Israel to take the promised land. It had been 40 years since he and the other 11 spies first surveyed the land in Numbers 14 and 34. How many, how many realize that? It was 40 years from the time they spied the land until they were able to go, go get it. That's a long time, folks. That shows perseverance. That shows people that just doesn't... See, sometimes we think of the, uh, of, of, of the blessings of God or the Word of God and we, we think it's just, you know, we know that grace is free and salvation is free, but how many knows this? We have to believe that God loves us and when we do, we serve Him with all of our heart and our life will resonate what's happening within our heart. So the closer that I draw to the Lord, the closer that He draws to me. The more my decisions change. Let me tell you something, friend. Each one of us today, any of us say that our thinking, what we believe about things has changed since we were 16 years old. All of us. Amen. Why? Because we learn. Because we hear. Because we listen. And can I tell you this? The more that we hear God's voice, the more that we walk with Him, the more we can hear His voice to speak in our heart. So the walls of Jericho. So we see 40 years now. And now it's time to go in and take this land. While it was truly a land filled with milk and honey, Joshua still remembered both him and Caleb tearing their clothes in disgust because the other spies saw the cities. The other spies saw the, the, the giants and they were afraid of what they were going to run into. And so Joshua and Caleb rent their clothes. As Joshua came near to Jericho some 40 years later, he looked up and saw the commander of the Lord's army standing before him with a drawn sword. Joshua 5.13 Whoo! Can I tell you this? When you're walking the Lord's walkway, He's got an army to go with you. He's got angels that's round about you. Amen. Joshua fell on his face. He fell down in reverence, removed his sandals, for he was standing on holy ground. He had the same experience that Abraham had. Amen. The same experience, I'm sorry, that Moses had. 
So here we see he's the next one in line from Moses. And here Joshua was taken over. And now he's seeing the anointing of God being placed on him. And intently listens to what the Lord had to say about conquering Jer Jericho. The Lord told him this. Jericho had already been delivered into their hands. If he follows the plan of God, they're already delivered. Did everybody hear that? If we follow God's plan, we'll, the, the things that we're facing and the things that are ahead of us, God will already fight the battle. He will already defeat the enemy. So as we see this, He's remembering and He's going back. And in 5 and 14 and uh, 15, it says, And intently listen to what the Lord had to say about conquering Jericho. The Lord told him that Jericho had already been delivered into his hands if he followed his plan of judgment upon the nation. In verses 6 and 2. For six days he was to have the army march around the walls of the city and have seven priests carry trumpets of lamb's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day... He was to march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. Up until this time, Joshua told the army not to speak a single word until they heard a long blast on the, on the trumpets. And then they were to shout and the walls of the city would collapse and victory would be theirs. Don't that sound like a the plan of action? But how many of us would say, I don't think marching around those walls is going to do much anything. Hey, Amen. We march for seven days. And every day ain't nothing happening. It's not that. It's the faith of it. It's trusting God's Word. Let me tell you, what God tells us to do sometimes makes absolutely no sense. Think about it. The walls of Jericho. That Bible said that they actually, the walls were so wide that they could actually race chariots on the top of the wall. That's a wide wall. And we're going to walk around it and whenever the, the priests blow their trumpet and all of a sudden we're going to scream and all of a sudden the walls are coming down and all of a sudden it happens. It happens just like God said. And they didn't have to do anything. They didn't lose any life. They didn't lose any, anybody in the battle because God told them exactly what to do. The pathway. Let's go down just a little bit further. And I, you know, and there's more to this and I had a lot more that I was going to uh, hinge on. But let's go on just for a moment to King Ahab. Because King Ahab had done more evil in the eyes of the Lord than those before him in 1 Kings 16 and 30, God told Elijah to announce his wrath upon Israel that no dew nor rain would happen in the next few years. The Lord then told Elijah to flee Kareth Ravine where God instructed, listen, God instructed ravens to bring him bread. That's pretty amazing, man. But can I tell you, the God that made us is the God that made everything else and everything listens to what God says. Amen? Amen. Well, every, every tongue will confess. Every knee shall bow. We see here that God told Elijah to leave from there after the ravens had given him bread, but the water there began to dry up, so God told him to go to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and request food from a widow. When Elijah saw the widow gathering sticks, and listen, sometimes we think to ourselves, oh, if we could just have a millionaire. If we could just have some, somebody with a lot of money. The Bible says that Elijah was sent to a widow. Think about this for a minute. This was probably the, one of the poorest ladies around. God sends the prophet to her house. And as Elijah saw the widow gathering sticks, he asked her for something to drink and a piece of bread to eat. She explained to Elijah that all she had was a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. 
that was about to be used to prepare one last supper for her and her child, and then they were going to go die. Oh, the prophet told her, Don't be afraid, for if she granted this request to take care of the servant of God, the jar of flour would not be used up and the jug of oil would not run dry until the, Lord, the day that the Lord sends rain again. Going to somebody, anybody in here feel like you're not really what God could consider user material? He can use anybody if we're willing He's not looking for somebody that has the most ability. He's looking for the ones that's having the availability. I'm just available. Lord, I can't do much, but I'm here. Lord, I'm here. I want to know what, what you desire of my life. I want to find out what life is all about because I can tell you right now, if all there is in this life is what we're seeing right now, then we're going to be miserable people. But if there is an eternity coming and there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, then praise God, we make that pathway according to the will of God. Amen. Let's go a little bit further. So there, not only did God sustain the prophet, but He also sustained the widow that had faith as well. If we go on down just a little bit further, one last... <coughs> Scripture here. Paul. We talked a little bit about Paul earlier because Paul, you're talking about a man that was persecution to the church. He was there to destroy the church. We see that Paul, according to the Scripture, he is a descendant of Abraham. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Roman citizen and a biblical scholar trained at the feet of well-known scholar of, this, of the day, Gamaliel. By his own admission, Paul believed he had advanced in Judaism beyond many of his own age and was extremely zealous for Jewish traditions. That's Galatians 1 and 4. At the time, Paul was so convinced his love to protect the temple and the Torah and the traditions of His people was the right path to take that when Christ announced entry into the kingdom of God was based solely on faith in a risen Savior. John 3.16 Paul rejected it. He rejected what God had chosen. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 19 it's also found in several other places. For an example, in trying to make his path right, Paul went from one synagogue to another and if the Christians would not blaspheme Jesus, He had them put into prison and often cast His vote to have them put to death. It was not until He heard the word, Lord, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute Me? That He repented, then He repented and accepted the Lord's mission for life, which was ironically to preach the good news to the Gentiles and the Jewish people that He had been persecuting in Acts chapter number 9. So here's a man that set his course. Many, many of us feel like, even some that might be in here right now, well, how can I change course now? You know, how can I serve the Lord here? You know, we act like that asking the Lord to come into our life is, is, is so difficult. But whenever we do it, all it is is forgiveness. All it is is peace. So Paul's walking around and he's kind of getting in the spirit of things. He's kind of getting angry. As a matter of fact, he's already voted for some people to be put to death. And also Jesus, all, all of a sudden Jesus shines a light down. And the Bible said when light shone down that it knocked him off his donkey. Amen? And then the voice out of heaven said, Paul, why are you kicking against the pricks? And we're thinking, that's the funniest saying I've ever heard in my life. What does that mean? It literally what it means is he was taking his shoes off at the barefoot and kicking a cactus. That's 
that's what it was to try to come against God. It's not doing anything. You're, you're not doing anything. You're just hurting your own self. When the one that created heaven and earth and he created everything around us, all of a sudden he speaks down to Paul and Paul is immediately blinded. Paul could have lived the rest of his life blind. He could have went, on, went his own way. But Paul decided to obey the Spirit of the Lord and he went to a street called Straight and there was a man there named Ananias. And the Lord said, Ananias is going to pray for you. And Paul has to go that journey blind. He don't know where he's going. But he knows this. The Lord told him something. This has nothing to do with the message, but could you imagine how Ananias felt? Yeah. This dude's just setting me up. He's telling me he wants me to pray for him. Whenever I pray for him, he's going to slap the cuffs on me and I'm going to be put to death. Yeah. Amen? So he had to have faith too. And isn't it amazing if you read it? Look, go look in your Bible. It says when Paul went to where Ananias went, he went to a street called Straight. That ain't by accident, folks. There's a straight and narrow way, and it's the straight street. Amen. And the last thing is this. It affected Paul so much, he recounted his testimony more than once in the Scripture. He told him over and over about how the Lord loved me. You know what Paul said? And now I'm talking about Paul, and you know, we, we kind of know that the, the history, but Paul did not look at himself at anything else. He said, I am the chiefest of sinners. That's what he said. He said, I was the chiefest of sinners. And you know what? If he feels that way, you know what? Well, maybe we need to find out, God, what your pathway is. Lord, I've been walking this pathway for a long time, but maybe I need to experience you in a new Maybe I can see the light this morning. Maybe I can see the power of God and the anointing of God. Let's stand to our feet this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Three different ways. Three different ways that we would have probably sought and not trusted God but lean on our own understanding. But trust God in God with all our heart and lean not upon our own understanding and He will direct our pathway.